Well, it is not the result we were looking to talk about live here on YouTube after the match on the Lens Blue Podcast channel. Dan here alongside Nick. Sam will be joining us, CFC Central, shortly to break down an unfortunate return to the Chelsea men's football team with the Blues not walking away with anything to show from their trip to Anfield against Liverpool. Not the way we would hope this one was drawn up. It was ultimately a match that Chelsea thought, and I think we thought something could be done, something could happen, that they were not going to be as a stalwart side as they had been for that first uh, six or seven matches of the season. But on the day, Chelsea could not muster up enough to get it done. Nick, if you think about it, A three-word match review. Can you sum up your thoughts, feelings, emotions in three words? Or is it gonna? It's it will take more over the live stream, but uh, yeah. I mean, probably just major opportunity wasted. Uh, You know, I I don't think there was really anything in this game between these two teams. I think a draw would have been the most fair result that we could have garnered. Obviously, you know, we were not given a penalty in the first half. They were given a penalty in the first half. Um, You know the uh, chances on target, all the stats that you'll get into. I thought it was a very, very even game. Um, you know, it's it's definitely one of the better showings that we've put in at Anfield in, in some time. Uh, I know we've had a couple of scoreless draws in the last few years there, and that, but in generally we don't we don't win at Anfield. But I thought, you know, for the most part, the performance was good enough to to get that draw and uh, probably not the win because I think we've really faded in the second half, but. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a big opportunity missed because the the team played well enough to get a point out of this and really put a marker down for the rest of the league. Yeah, I mean, when you take a look at, and just maybe kind of to set the stage of some of the high level stats too, I mean, it was a 1.63 XG for Liverpool to a 0.93 for Chelsea. Uh, both sides, uh, Chelsea had two big chances and Liverpool had three. But when you take out the penalty, penalties are worth almost 0.8, 0.79. So on the day, Chelsea actually managed more attacking thrust than Liverpool just on the level of what do we kind of have in terms of the, the quality of shots, what we're putting in place. Uh, you know, uh, Tommy had a miss at Anfield, which I think is a really good three-word match review to kind of sum that up. But I would just say like any other day, like to me, any other day would be like a great three-word match review to set the stage because like this – any other day, like this could have been a Chelsea win, could have been a much more catastrophic Chelsea loss. I think on the day, to me, I, there are some moral victories I'll take away. And what feels like, Sam, as we think about this one, a day where we, we will point to the officials and say that this game was just another example of poor officiating, some really dodgy uh, VAR calls, some inability to manage the game appropriately. And, uh, you know, Brooks was actually getting praise initially in the first half for how he was managing the game. And then the commentators, at least on the U.S. broadcast feed, uh, changed their tune around the 60th to 70th minute when things got a little bit more heated. But how did you feel about this one? From a refereeing standpoint, I think Colin Miller of uh, The Athletic summed it up perfectly. So, he said whoever was the fourth, the like the official taking care of the VAR calls, he did say like, you know, there was a justification for the Curtis Jones penalty and he gave a reason for it. And when it was overturned, Mike Dean basically said, oh, it was overturned because, because of this. So you yourself have zero idea in terms of what the right call is. And it just tells you that officials in the league just cannot be trusted um, under whatsoever circumstances. So again, angsty, but at this point, I've become numb to it. Like I genuinely don't uh, want to bring up refereeing performances because especially against Liverpool, it just keeps happening to us. At cup finals, semi-finals, huge occasions, especially at critical junctures. So unfortunately, I've just kept it out of my match analysis altogether and said, look at everything else and see how we held up. If I Yeah, if I were Maresca heading into this game, knowing that Liverpool get calls at Anfield just like United get calls at Old Trafford, I would have said to my team, "Hey, we're gonna, we're we're not going to to win the refereeing on the day. We're not going to get more calls. Uh, we have to play like we're going to be one nil down the entire time uh, because that's that's basically the advantage, right? Uh, the the penalty that we should have had just a really quick uh, thing from Kieran Gill uh, of the Daily Mail. He says regarding Chelsea's penalty claim, the one that 
uh, Trent obviously steps on on Sancho and it wasn't given. Um, VAR Michael Oliver, uh, noted excellent referee, uh, did check Trent uh, Alexander Arnold's challenge on Jaden Sancho, but he confirmed John Brooks' original decision that should stand after watching the replays. So, you know, again, like Sam, I think your point's fair. We talk about refereeing all the time. I, I don't know what else to say at this point that's going to fix the problem necessarily, but it is an inflection point in the match that, you know, in a game where there were multiple penalty opportunities, you know, two for us, uh, or sorry, one for us, two for them, that, you know, it, it's fine margins in this game to, to potentially get a point. And and I think if I were Maresca, my, my team at halftime would have been like, hey, I told you this was going to happen. I told you that, you know, one of these things was not going to go our way. Let's let's just amp up. And, you know, I was, I was pretty pleased with the overall performance. Here's the question I'd like to pose to both of you. And, you know, just we we now have had a chance to play against one of the top teams in the Premier League this season. We've had a bit of an easier run of schedule, relatively speaking, outside of the Man City match to start the season. Are you feeling better about this team after today's performance? Are you feeling the same as you were heading into this match? But where you think this team can achieve? Or are you feeling like there's maybe less optimistic about where we're at. And, you know, I think Sam, we, we talked about this a little bit in the preview show too, about this being the litmus test for this Chelsea side for Maresca, particularly after having a round of fixtures that were more kind to us, but where did you, or where are you heading? Feeling better, feeling worse, feeling the same. I know Sam. I know he might be. No, he's never not one for words. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, so just to give you some context, then I was looking up the numbers from previous fixtures. So, this is the most amount of shots we've had at Anfield since 2016. So, that's eight years. So, in terms of going to a place where obviously it's very difficult to get a result, we've gone there, given a good account of ourselves. And, like you said, the penalty was a massive inflection point. If you take that away, we are basically power on XG. We're almost close in terms of shots. So I would probably say that Maraska, like Nick said, just has to say, keep your head down. You know, it got away from us because of factors that weren't in our control. So we've got great fixtures coming up now uh, against sides where you can make a statement win. If you go and get, you know, steal a 2-0, 3-0 win against Newcastle or Arsenal have lost 2-0 against Bournemouth. If you get a result there, then you know the outlook changes completely. So I think we're on the right track. I do think we we again did pretty well in terms of I can't I can't find any tactical faults. I can't even sort of blame Maresca saying he should have made this sub earlier. I think he did everything correctly. So uh, it's just one thing uh, where you have to keep your head on and move on. Uh, Nick Nick's sort of wincing here, uh, but I would love to hear uh, what what you sort of found was well. So, oh, so I'll answer the first question first. Yes, I please. Think, I think the I went on the BBC uh, Sports World before the match, like right before the match. Don't brag too hard. It's a slight humble brag there, Dan. Um, don't be jealous. It's fine. You'll get on next time. I I think um, I, the as I was kind of thinking about this game yesterday, I you know there was all this. I think the media hypes this game up, right? And for good reason. It's usually a, a great fixture, really high intensity fixture. You know, there's a ton of history between these two thing, two teams. Sometimes we get the better of them. Sometimes they get the better of us. I didn't really feel like there was a whole lot of pressure on this game, to be completely candid. I, th you know, Obviously, we all wanted to win this. I'm pissed that we didn't at least draw this game. But between these two managers, these are two new managers, new to the Premier League, right? New to this fixture. At Anfield, after an international break, they have injuries. We're, we are kind of getting healthy for the first time, but we have suspensions, right? Like there's, there's a whole lot of factors that go into this game where you're like, I don't know. It just didn't feel like it was like the end of the world necessarily. If we, if we didn't come out on top to me, because, you know, I do feel like this team struggles back from the international break, um, you know, to, to play for the first match or two, and then they really warm up. And luckily for us, there are no more international breaks until, what March of next year. And so I think we're, we're going to feel like this team can finally get going like properly for the first time. And so I, you know, I, I wasn't, I, I don't know. I didn't really feel that Dan heading into this game. I don't really know if I take this result and like put it on a pedestal above the other results of the season so far. I think we're fine. We're not great. We're not bad. 
Yeah, I would agree with that. I think in general, I would say I'm still where I was feeling before the international break, which is I feeling in like we're heading in the right direction. Like we're seeing the right type of growth from this side. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at it, Chelsea's last win against Liverpool. This is going to hurt to say March 4th, 2021. It mm -hmm. has been a minute and we've played, yeah, we've played them a lot. We've played them in the league cup twice since then. We played them in the FA cup as well. In addition to all of our league fixtures. And it's just not been good sledding since, you know, really uh, the past couple of years. I mean, it's been draws and losses, three consecutive losses in a row across all competitions. So I think if we were expecting anything, it would have been, can we get back to drawing? Then we, can we get back to winning? Can we just make those incremental steps? We're not looking to kind of get to the point. And if you, take out the penalty. If you take out some of the dodgy decisions, this game does feel more on the bounce in terms of I think a, a feeling better about where this side is. I, you know, when we talk about though, Sam, you mentioned a couple of things that you wouldn't fault Maresca for. And then Nick winced. I'm going to guess we can talk about now a few of those, because I think there were some, particularly as we look at even just the starting lineup, we knew that there were going to be a lot of players who were on international duty, maybe not starting. I think there were a couple major surprises, though, particularly with Reese James starting and right back. That was not, and I think anybody's bingo card for this match, not in anybody's necessarily lineup, even though we had seen him in the training photos. We had heard the reporting from Matt and others about him being ready to contribute. This came, I think, as a big shock to us. That might have been one that had, I think, a kind of question mark around it. And then that meant... Malgusto on the left-hand side going up against Sala, which was a big, big duty for him and does not feel like it was the best use of his skill set, at least in my view, Nick. But were those some of the things that you kind of question marks around when you're thinking about Dim Reska get a couple of things wrong today, at least in the initial setup? Um, I don't, I didn't really find fault with the initial setup. I mean, I, I think when you looked at Reese, Lavia and Tosin coming in, you knew that Reese and Lavia were not going to be 90 minutes fit, right? I mean, so I like them coming off in whatever it was, the 50th or 60th minute. Um, I don't have the exact number. It was not like a massive shock to me. I think it was a way to protect Vega, frankly, to put Gusto on the left. And I was I was pretty happy with that overall. I think the risk, the only risk that I have, Sam, when we play Reese and, and Gusto on the same uh in the same lineup on on different sides is that man, if one of those guys gets injured, we are in a world of hurt again, right? And it just makes me worry that there's not someone waiting in the wings necessarily. Um, but, you know, overall, I was, I was pretty, I was pretty happy with, with the fact that both of them were back. And I thought that Lavia was truly excellent when he played today. And I have not been over the moon about him to this point in the season. I think he's been good. I thought he was really great today. Well, I mean, in terms of on the ball, yes. The moment he dropped his shoulders, Liverpool players were falling like flies, which was great to see in, in midfield. But I think out of possession, he struggled a couple of times. I did point out that he was on Ryan Gravenberg, who, in my opinion, has been one of the best central midfielders uh, in the Premier League this season. And a couple of times, Gravenberg did to him what Lavia was doing to other people. So we did struggle. I think there were a couple of a five minute spell before the penalty where we just completely lost our minds and the ball just kept going you know in a in a ping pong manner in that middle third and lavia could not cope in that sequence so like you mentioned i think it was an essential change to make uh dan and i were on the preview podcast and we talked about this would you put vega at left back against mohammed salah and i said no i would rather sort of see gusto at left back so we did call that saying that that might happen so his hands were tied. Again, it was a big risk throwing Reese James right into the deep end. I think he did pretty well, but uh, we need him back as soon as possible. You ideally want him with 60 minutes in his legs before we reach Arsenal, Newcastle and, and that run of games. So, um, in my humble opinion, I couldn't fault that from Mareska saying, cards are on the table, let's go for it. And then I think a couple of the other maybe interesting decisions that you kind of look at here. I mean, so we, we had that first 15 minute block, Nick, that felt like Liverpool were just playing around with us, took us an opportunity, a minute to get settled, it highlighted again by the commentators that, you know, we still are fielding the youngest lineup in the Premier League two seasons in a row, which is 
makes sense. You know, if you had players in at the age 19 or 20 last season, and they're only now 21 or 22, and you don't have Tiago Silva in your lineup anymore, you are going to field potentially the youngest lineup in the Premier League. Um, but it felt like after that first 15 minutes, then there was another round of 15 minutes that felt like we had solidified ourselves there. Did you see anything just how we were maybe changing our approach, you know, for that first 15 to the second 15, you know, 16th to 30th minute that kind of gave us a little bit more confidence? I, I mean, I just think that the team kind of settled a little bit, like the passes were becoming more crisp. Uh, Chelsea identified very early, and I called this out on Twitter if you were following me during the game, that there were huge gaps between Liverpool's midfield and their defensive line. And we finally started putting people there. And it was interesting that, like, I think to get to some of those mismatches, Palmer would come and play six, and then Caicedo would dive in behind to break that press. And you saw that multiple times in this game where, you know, we just created our own our own luck at times. And I, and I was really pleased about that. This This Liverpool are the best defensive team in the league fallacy that exists. It, they are not. Um, I, I don't, I don't think they're like incredibly impenetrable. I just think they're, they're good. You know, you know, we certainly didn't take our chances today, but Chelsea really built into the game. And for, I know Arne Slott's, uh, you know, disposition to game is for his team to have the ball. And I thought we had, a ton of the ball. We controlled possession. We controlled the narrative in the game for the most part. I think up until like the 75th minute when maybe subs and changes just kind of let the game go. But for the mid part of the game, you take the two end caps off of it. I thought we were in control, very comfortable, you know, a couple moments of madness for the uh, two penalty shouts. But I don't know. I, I didn't find any real fault in it. I, th I think once the subs came in, that's where things started to not necessarily go our way but um for that for that period i was really pleased maybe and sam too you know we kind of talked about this idea of uh the, the subs that we started getting in and maybe even talking about in the framing of first half versus second half in terms of the experience and comfort you know look at first half chelsea managed three total shots one one big chance against the four and two that Liverpool had. You flip it to the second half. We had nine total shots, one big chance. They had four with the one. So he did better, much, much better in the second half too, even after some of those changes took place. I mean, it felt like even though there was a bit of a struggle within that first, you know, little bit here, you know, our goal came in the second half very early. You know, we did kind of give up the Curtis Jones goal, which was very unfortunate. Um, Robert Sanchez forgetting he can use his hands maybe in that exact moment there, but it did feel as if, uh, you know, we, we kind of point to, you know, Mareska needs to be able to find opportunities, find ways to improve the team on the pitch. You know, it did feel like Ben bad was, was a really nice sub. Absolutely. Completely, uh, twisted Nunez's mind into a noodle, which was fun to watch. And, you know, Pedro Neto came on and I thought looked really, really sharp, uh, particularly on the left-hand side. Uh, maybe the Nkunku sub putting him on the left is uh, is a question mark, but it did feel as if the subs in general gave us a little bit of a, a, a bounce in terms of our ability to comp be competitive in this fixture. Yeah, uh, in terms of certain individual performances, I we had certain doubts about can this player perform in this particular sequence. So, for example, Jaden Sancho has had only one shot in 300 plus minutes. And that he's played for us. And today he had four 1v1 isolations against Trent Alexander Arnold of all people. And when you do have that opportunity, you should be basically like making him do the tango inside the box. But Sancho was delaying. He was essentially trying to, you know, take little steps into the box. And by the time he decided to act, Liverpool had two players back. So in terms of at least doing our bit, we did get the ball to him as, as soon as possible. It's just the player didn't deliver on the day. And you saw that when Neto came on on the left-hand side, there were multiple moments where he drove diagonally inside, gave Liverpool lots of issues. And I think when that tends to happen, then you do realise that your plan was spot on. It's just the individual who was asked to perform or execute a certain responsibility didn't come up trumps. But... I, I thought after that half that he should have been subbed off, and that's exactly what Mareska did. He put Neto on. Then, you know, he wanted to sort of flip Reese James out and make sure that he's protected. So in terms of the changes, I thought all of them were sort of well thought out, well made. And on a different day, if that penalty doesn't happen, I think 
we go into the last 10 minutes actually giving Anfield, you know, a completely frenzied time. It's just, unfortunately, we were chasing a goal. But throughout the narrative, even in the first half, like you like you said, we had the lesser of the shots, but we had 60% of the ball uh, for most of the half against Liverpool. And they were sitting in a mid-block, a 4-2-4, trying to make sure that they didn't commit any mistakes. So they were respecting us. They feared our quality, which is a testament to what we're trying to build. And, and that's the positive that I take away for, for our next games. And you know, maybe as we kind of think about that, you know, too, Nick, if there are players that you felt like really showed you something in this match, you know, are there one or two that you feel better about or feel like they contributed at a high level. I know we sometimes talk about the player of the match, the man of the match, the Dan of the match, like who, who is that in your mind today for Chelsea? If there's, you know, one or two candidates. Um, I mean, I, I thought Lavi and Caicedo were great when they were uh, playing together in the first half. Um, so I was really pleased about that. Um, obviously, the attack kind of sputtered, but I thought that Nico did grow into the game and, and was making a ton of runs and just we couldn't find him. The, the reverse ball wasn't on for him through the, through the, uh, the run that he was making, uh, but the goal was really good. Matawake should have seen a hell of a lot more of the ball today than he was given, uh, which was really disappointing. And then Neto on the left was way better than Neto on the right for me. Um, I thought that Neto had a run on Trent uh, after a really kind of average Sancho first half to, you know, performance. And when we made that change, I think one of the major talking points I want to, I want to bring up for the group here, maybe I'll pass this to Sam is when we make the change to bringing Kunku on, it, it, I think it screwed up the flow. I thought that Neto should have stayed on the left. I thought Palmer should have went out wide to try and find some space and get on the ball in a more comfortable area. And I thought that Nkunku should have played through the middle. Instead, Nkunku's on the left. Uh, Palmer remains in the middle where he, he had his, probably his worst performance of the season so far. And then Neto went on the right, and it just didn't work. Like It was, it was really disappointing to see the tactical move that Maresca made. And when I grimaced earlier at your Maresca got everything right comment, this is what I'm talking about because yeah, so the, you know, there's some things that like, you know, he can control in a game. And this is one of those things where the players line up. And I just don't, I don't understand why you would make that move over to you, sir. No, I think it's a fair point to be honest. And uh, I do sympathize with, with Mareska because he's had to make these, these calls because we all know Nkuku is not a winger. We tried to put him at centre forward versus Ghent and he could not win a duel against them. So uh, maybe that's something that put it out in his mind saying, where do I play him? And the only option you saw was to either bring him on the wing where he has to track back and help his fullbacks, which he does not do very well. And if you put him at number 10, then obviously you have to throw Palmer out, who's averaging 1.23 um, goals or assists uh, in terms of like per 90. So it's a big dilemma. I thought on the left-hand side, if he had Mudrik, then it would have been like a good option to sort of maintain a 1v1 with Trent Alexander-Arnold. But again, we know what Mudrik does when he's on the pitch. Most of the times he cuts inside and his shot sort of gives a marsh in a concussion. But um, yeah, again, it's... I always look at it as the grass is greener, uh, but unfortunately, again, the decisions he made, I thought were were decent. I I really can't fault them from a tactical perspective. I would have ideally liked Nkunku to come in at a number 10 position behind Jackson. Like you said, maybe centrally would have been great, but we're still to figure out how to play him, um, Lavia or Enzo uh, in the same side and not sort of lose our out of position solidity. I think that's going to be the big question mark for him. Why why that didn't make sense for me, Sam, is because, look, I think Liverpool were aware of our threat out wide, and and even then we had some success. Like I, I don't, I don't think again when I we hear this talk about Liverpool being this incredible defense. I mean, we had a ton of the ball. We kind of had our run of the game for a lot of it, and our wingers, I think, could have even done more in this game, despite the fact that they were kind of hedging our, their bets for us to play through the outside the biggest part of our game today that, that I liked the most is when we played through the middle, when we played in behind those gaps uh, that their, their two sixes were leaving. And that's why I wanted Nkunku in that spot because he's going to be the best driver of the ball. If he is able to receive the ball in that position, he's obviously a great passer, but he has a shot on him too. Like I just, I, you have Trent on toast because, because of Neto's speed and the fact that Neto started driving inside. 
Then you'd have Nkunku. Then you'd have Palmer kind of finishing it up. And I get that you don't want to bring Palmer off in, in a game because he is so dangerous and it just takes one little moment for him to change the game, almost like a striker in some way. But like that would have made so much more sense to me. Palmer was obviously not super successful in the day, looked a little rusty. And I don't know. I was just like, it, it felt like a really poor uh, error that was that was not geared towards winning, but that was more geared toward protecting a deficit. And I just didn't get it. I mean, we, we, we did see, I think, um, you, know, you talk about Palmer, who I think didn't, ne- didn't necessarily have his best game. If you even look at the, the SOFA score ratings, which we reference occasionally, uh, would be his worst performance uh, since the kind of start of this uh, season. So in terms of overall rating, definitely did not imprint himself the same way. I think he had one really good chance in the second half where if he had taken the shot earlier versus letting the defense get sorted, he potentially could have tested Kelleher appropriately. But you know, I think to your point, I I did like the fact that we were trying to beat them in transition. I mean, that's how the the Nico goal came together. I mean, I think I would love to talk about him in particular. Like, I think he it is a hard it is hard to be an opposition striker playing at Anfield. Like, it is not a fun place to be. You don't get a lot of decisions going your way in any any way, shape, or form. I mean, he only had eighteen touches on the day, which is not necessarily a ton. Like, he was. I think generally very isolated from you know the other players didn't necessarily have a, a ton of opportunity to get involved. I mean, he hit the woodwork once and then converts on the goal, which had a 0.33 XG, like timed his run extremely well to get that situated. I mean, I think there've been times where he pointed and said like, hey, you really need to figure out how to stay on side. And like, mm-hmm. you want more of those 50, 50, like tie goes to the runner type of situations where you're, you're making it difficult for the official to raise the flag. You're putting the defenders on notice. You're making them uncomfortable. And he did a really, really nice job within that. I mean, you know, we have seen in pr- previous seasons when we had Lukaku previously, you know, famously judged offside, even though definitely on in, in that scenario, we got the inverse of that today with the initial offside but actually on type of situation this this felt like a really really good uh, opportunity to continue to bolster his resume as you know a top tier striker in the premier league a great number nine for chelsea and you know someone who is worth continuing to invest in it yeah eight goal contributions in eight games i mean i don't know what else you really want uh, you know i don't I don't really think he had a ton of opportunities. He kind of had that like sliced one in the first half where he, where he took the run on and, and kind of put a little bit high and wide, but he got his one chance and he took it. Um, do I wish he would have received more of the ball in those areas? Yes, I do. Cause especially on a day where Palmer is not firing Sam, like this is, this is a guy who can really hurt an opposition. You, you saw his hold up play at the end when we were struggling for possession you know, his, his moves, his uh, ball control. I mean, he is really evolving into the player that I think, you know, when, when our scouting team scouted him, they, they thought he could become, which is uh, a really, really good, if not top tier striker. Absolutely spot on. It's just my concern is uh, we, we say the same things about Moises Caicedo as well. And it becomes very hard for us to figure out when do you rest him, which fixtures do you play him for. Um, it's going to be a long-term headache and until we get like somebody like Andreas Santos or Leslie Gochuku back um, and sent to forward again. I really don't know. Duran signed a long-term extension. We'll have to probably dig deep, go back to the whiteboard and figure out who's the next guy that we want to pick off. But uh, it's an excellent point, Nick. I think he's consistently given um, Liverpool centre-backs an issue. Even the first time that he played on the first day of the season under Poch, he gave Konate absolute headache with the way that he was moving. And oh, yeah. I, I watched Haaland earlier today. Uh, he had 13 touches, didn't win a single duel. I don't know how many shots he had, but basically non-existent. And you're going to have games like that where your centre-backs basically save your bacon and you end up grabbing a winner in in you know stoppage time. And... Even then, he sort of like kept up, made sure that he had his head up. When when he went down for the shot, I think he had basically his, his back caught up or he had a cramp or something and he was struggling in between, but still decided to get up and push on and credit to him. We've always mentioned he's mentally resilient and all he wanted to sort of 
we wanted him to do was get his runs right, make sure that he's composed enough to pick the right moment, the right decision, and no complaints whatsoever. It's it's hard to get more than two shots away at Anfield as any centre forward, and that's something that you have to accept. And the fact that one of them went in props to him. So well done, to be honest. Sam, when you look though, you know, directly behind Nico with Cole, I know we talked about him briefly. What did you see in this performance? Was it more down to the way he was set up positionally? I mean, we know that he's had a little bit of a free roll before. Was it maybe due to the fact that he was being asked to do more defensively in this match to try and, you know, stymie the Liverpool uh, assault on the left hand side, uh, coming at our, you know, our right hand side? Or was it maybe just down to you know fatigue after kind of being relied upon so heavily? Like, what did you kind of highlight as to why Cole wasn't necessarily able to imprint himself on on this match particularly? The two reasons I think one was basically that he had to keep an eye on Curtis Jones, who was moving everywhere, and I think uh, when you had Lavia and Kaiser taking care of Gravenberg and also keeping an eye on Shabu's life, then that, that extra midfielder had to be catered for. So Palmer had basically one eye there. He also had to make sure that the centre-backs weren't making much progress. So multiple responsibilities also played a part in terms of doing it. But I thought he just had an off day in terms of execution. Usually see, you see him you know, in, in these tight pockets with two players around him. And he is spot on, like the way that he picks his decisions, the way that he picks his pass. Today was a little bit erratic, like you said, maybe looked a little leggy. Um, and, and some players inevitably come back from the international break with rust to scrape off. So we'll just give him the sandpaper and say, OK, you know, scrape it off. And, and you know, even superstars are allowed to have a day off. And, and hopefully the next game he can, he can click and fire. But uh, I don't think it was anything tactical. It wasn't like he was being tightly man-marked or he was being clattered or around in multiple fouls against him. I thought he was relatively OK. It's just didn't deliver on the day, which is, as a young player, fine. He, he looked nervous to me, Sam. I, I'll, I'll be honest. He looked a little frazzled by the atmosphere. You know, I don't think that the fullbacks helped at all in this game with our center backs. I thought that Reese and Gusto were trying to get into the midfield so much. They were both inverting at times that it just, it was a ton of isolation. It was a ton of extra work for those guys to do. You saw the early Tosin yellow card where he was kind of clumsily, you know, kind of fell on uh, Shota, Levi, obviously a couple of penalty close calls and one given in a space of like two minutes, you know, it just looked like they were unsure of where to be and they didn't have any protection to be fair to them. But, you know, we've seen these sort of up and down performances from Levi. And I, I think it is a part of his growth path to become you know, I think we we all think he can become, which is this this really excellent talisman center back for our club, you know, future leader of our club. It's I think in moments like this, the game does look like it gets to him a little bit. And, you know, I think it will it will serve him well in future encounters that he has, you know, these sorts of experiences. But Nick, did you did you sort of feel that maybe Gusto on the other side, being that more aggressive presence down the left, do you think that was in part to play? Because usually you've got Gusto on the right hand side pushing up, yeah, and and he's pushing the other players back. So there's a little more uh, of a of a space in that half space which he really likes receiving the ball. And I think today those opportunities were very limited. And that's why I think Madueke also had pretty pretty quiet game. Like he didn't receive a lot of one v ones. I think the first one he received was when Reese found like a lovely curved long ball but that was the only one that i remember in the first half i'll probably have to go back and look but um, i think those isolations were very limited against somebody like a robertson we we, we got too narrow uh, you know and, and i think when when reese and gusto push in it gets so narrow and that's a part of the reason why i thought caicedo getting forward was was such an excellent twist to the uh the tactical piece because i in this system that we're playing both fullbacks can't do that it does isolate the center backs i just don't think the center backs were very good in their 1v1s for a lot of the game i thought it was uh they got aggressive too early and then they had to back off because they were both on yellows and it just didn't 
Yeah, I, I think the game kind of got away from them a little bit there. But I do think it was partly because the fullbacks were so uh, far advanced and, and into midfield that it left huge gaps in behind, for sure. Yeah, I mean, we... Yeah, we that, um, could, I, could I just... Could I just yeah, jump please. in with like a little bit of a snippet? Apologies. Uh, Nick, this was something that I actually wanted to do a piece on, maybe on the newsletter. Uh, in terms of, you know, we look at defensive actions or we look at maybe tackles or interceptions in isolation. But how much more difficult is it for a defender to make it when you've just about sprinted 60, 70 yards and you're basically like still recovering, catching your breath? And if you remember that Colville incident for the penalty, just about 10 seconds before he had like sprinted 70 yards. Mm -hmm. And the moment he gave away the penalty, the first thing he went, he went onto his haunches and he was like struggling to breathe. And it looked like he was, he was absolutely like worn out at that point in time. So I think like you mentioned, being open in those transitions, seeing that panic of, of Mohamed Salah receive 1v1, that sort of got to him and, and erratic decisions happened there. So the, the only pushback I'd have on that, because like, yeah, I, I do remember that vividly. That was like the 35th minute. Like, you know, I, I still wonder about the fitness of some of these guys that like, sure, you know, I wouldn't on, on my best day want to try and mark Mo Salah at all. You right? sure? Like, yeah, no, I'm very sure. But like, <laughs> you know, Levi, Levi does have the physicality. Levi does have the speed. Levi has typically shown the endurance. And we were starting to get a, a lot more of the ball at that point in the game. And so it does just kind of run counter to me that like he would have been that gassed that early in the game. And, and I don't, I don't know if it's like a, a rust issue or if it's a fitness issue or whatever, but like, man, you know, I, if you're, if you're that gassed in the 35th minute, it's gonna be a long day for you. You know? I mean, just if you're looking at the stats and, you know, and for Levi in particular, so he won four out of the nine ground duels he faced. He won one of the three aerial duels that he was uh, kind of up against here. So not the best performance from him. I think they're, you know, definitely you know, the, the challenge of having to defend with Gusto being so far forward, definitely put him into a less advantageous position. I mean, you look at Gusto's heat map. I mean, and again, he spent time on both wings, so it's a little bit split, but the amount of time he spent in that like actual defensive area for a left back, very minimal. Uh, and you see plenty of times where like Levi is like spotted in that area on that heat map. So definitely asked him or required him to do more. Well, I think, you know, we, we uh, missed Kukurea today. I mean, we did. we did like, there's, there's no, there's no doubt about it. And, and I know that's, if you listen to the show one year ago, you're like, what is Nick? the transport in time and, and see the, few, yeah, Kukurea has been excellent there. And I also think Kukurea today would have added a little bit of shit house to this game that we probably needed. Uh, there was a lot going on from the other side. There wasn't a ton going on on our side. And I, I just, I, I want that edge in a big game. I want that player who's gonna, who's gonna be a little bit feisty and, and, and work his way in. He's been that guy for us so far. So, you know, it, it was a big miss for sure that, you know, the yellow card accumulation is just, you know, bitting us in the ass again. Well, and then there's the, the Rob Bob situation too, with Sanchez in the back. You know, I mean, he de definitely had, you know, one or two uh, decent saves um, inside the box, but then, uh, you know, passed into directly like a Liverpool player at one point, very early into the match in the first half. Uh, didn't read the penalty kind of situation well after having stopped the last two penalties he'd faced for us. So, I mean, again, you're, you're not expecting most of the time for your goalkeeper to stop a penalty. It's just that's why it's a 0.8 XG most like most of the time. Like it is harder to miss them <laughs> uh, if you really want to try. And so I, I know, Sam, you know, this probably is just the con kind of a continuation of the story that like, we are just going to have great days from Sanchez. We're going to have mid days from Sanchez and we're going to have not great, not great at all to bad days from Sanchez. Cause he's just not an elite goalkeeper uh, in, in the sport at the moment. And so like that is a, a liability um, in the back of our, our defense. I agree. And you either want, I mean, when you're trying to compete, and get to the top three positions. You want a an elite shot stopper, and with the Maresca system, you also need somebody who is absolutely brilliant with his feet. And unfortunately, you've landed smack bang in the middle in terms of both categories. So I think you will have to spend heavily to get a goalkeeper from the market. The issue is 
that you can only get one or the other at the price range that we're looking at. So it's hedging our bets on the younger guys, you know, throwing maybe like 10, 15 million at somebody like a Petrovic, 10, 20 million on Benders, and then we've got like 11 goalkeepers already and praying to the gods that the maths odds work out and then one of them tends to be a superstar. But Thomas on the, the LIVB board was excellent with his Mike Penders analysis. So if, if anybody in the audience is interested in terms of what we are signing, please do go and listen to, to that board on the channel. But yeah, exciting. But at this moment, like short term, unless Jorgensen turns out to be an absolute blinder uh, somewhere, you know, midway through the season, I, I don't think it's going to be an issue, a consistent issue. Uh, Nick, your your opinions on, on this? Uh, I mean, it, it was a midday. It wasn't, I don't think it was like the worst we've ever seen him by any means. It was dodgy at times. And I do think like as Chelsea FCRK says here, I appreciate the super chat. That's excellent. Um, I it, To me, the the cardinal sin is not getting big on uh, like as, as an attacker is, is crash and a goal. Like your, your number one goal, get big try and make it as hard as possible. And, and like, look, Curtis Jones is a fine player, but he's not a, a great striker of the ball by any means. He's, he's good, but like, there's no reason that that goal has to happen. It's a great pass in, but he miscontrols the touch and he has to kind of like lunge at it to, to get any sort of like touch on the ball to, to get it over the line. Sanchez could have easily, you know, put an arm up and deflected that down. And, and I think they, Again, we're talking about small margins here, man. We're talking about really, really small margins. You know, that that movement doesn't go. We don't get the penalty. That's These are the reasons why we're, we're talking about a loss today instead of a draw. I mean, he, you know, just in, to kind of put it into perspective, he had three goals two seasons ago, five goals last season. So this would be the first goal this season uh, after having two total starts, uh, now, uh, three and then, uh, seven matches played. Yeah. So, I mean, again, not expecting him to score often for Liverpool or to be a primary contributor. He had eight total goal contributions all of last season. So again, mm -hmm. not putting up tons of numbers. Mareska's comments are starting to filter in from the match. I mean, he talked a little bit about, you know, the penalty appeal, uh, he, kind of didn't really touch on it specific uh you know since his response directly was like that performance was good we don't like having no points but if you had to choose a way then this is the way i've been in the stadium many times it's not easy we control the game for most parts of the game we dominated the game but we lost uh we are not happy the performance was very good on the conceded goals he mentions the first is a penalty <laughs> no surprise the second goal we've already avoided uh this season five or six goals but sometimes you concede but to come here against this team, to not concede chances, it's impossible. We have to be proud of the defending we did, but a little, a little upset but because we don't like the results. Uh, on the James and Lavia subs, he mentioned uh, it was an hour maximum for both of them for fitness mm -hmm. considerations. So he decided to change them after the 55 minutes. Uh, on the penalty decision, they pressed him again. Uh, he said, I'm relaxed. I'm not happy because we lost, but I'm happy because of the performance of the team. The decision of the referee has been clear for everyone. The referee is there to take the decision. Sometimes they're right. Sometimes they're wrong, which is probably uh, about as much as you can say without getting or contributing to the FA's Christmas party fund. Uh, if, so if, if I speak, I'm in big trouble. That sort of vibe. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a, a little closer to the reality of like, you know, how, how hard do you want to say that they were wrong? Uh, and then on defense, he mentioned, uh, we need to work on clean sheets and many things. If you see the goal we score and the one we concede, the goal we score, we are probably third or fourth best. Uh, and the goal we concede, we are third or fourth for conceding these goals. We can do better. So, I mean, I I, I do think, Nick, in general, I, I like the fact that we're still continuing to see from Reska a pretty balanced you know, response and narrative. Like he's not, you know, overselling how good we played. I think he's pointing out that there are areas we can still – improve he's not putting it on to into you know particular players who are maybe necessarily contributing and so you know, i think he's continuing to build confidence i mean he took the the team over to the way supporters again even after the loss today to you know celebrate those who made the trip made the trek had to, who, who will have to sit through and walk through the jeers uh back you know, for, to the stadium and then back from the stadium, which uh, never feels good uh, when you're in a ways, you know, a way supporter on the day having to uh, go, whether you win or lose, you are going to get jeered pretty heavily. And so, yeah, I think that he's continuing to put himself in a good position with the supporters. 
again, there, there, there's not much in this. I, I think, you know, I saw a lot of angst on, on Twitter after the match because the result wasn't what we wanted. And I think there is a kind of an undercurrent of impatience or, or maybe not impatience. Maybe that's not the right word, but I think there's an undercurrent of wanting this team to be back so bad, you know, to be competing at the highest level, to be, competing for minimum top four and, and definitely for the title at some point, we're just not there yet. Uh, I think, I think broader strokes here, it, you know, the team has, has over performed uh, to this point in the season. Uh, we had a couple of disappointing results against palace and forest. This will feel like we should have taken a draw where, where it was a loss. They're not quite at the level to, to compete with the others. Right. And I, and I do think that this is a, a moment where we all just need to take a collective breath as a community and go, all right, we played well, we had 60% of possession or whatever at Anfield. Like this, this is not a bad performance by any means. It just wasn't quite good enough to get over the hump. Right. Tons of moments, tons of 50 fifties, right. A crazy amount of, at refereeing errors. Uh, one that really stuck with me uh, again was Caicedo easily winning the ball and being called for a foul You're in the in midfield in the center circle. You're just like, all right, whatever. Uh, but it just, you know, I think the broader fan context here, and I don't know if you agree with this or not, Sam, but I think we got a little, the community got a little bit ahead of itself. And maybe this is just a, a studying moment to go. All right, we have work to do. To be honest, Nick, after the years we've had in the past, I, I don't mind people getting ahead of themselves. At one point, the bridge was, you know, graveyard. Honestly, like, I think players dreaded playing there. Genuinely, the, the energy was off. There was, like you mentioned, angst and anxiety hanging like you know, electricity in the air. So I do think there's, there's it's good to have a little bit of inflated optimism. Mm -hmm. And last season, we got, we got thumped 4-1. So... In hindsight, when you're looking at maybe like going there, showing a, a little bit more control, showing a little bit more restraint, it wasn't end to end to a point where, you know, Liverpool had 22 shots, 23 shots. They had eight today, mm -hmm. which when you're looking at a very good attacking side is, is a good number. So it, we didn't get blown out of the water. I know it sounds very defeatist and, and it's maybe right to say, oh, we should be aiming for more. Yes, we should be. But... At this point in the season, you should be just competing well against the top four sides, top three sides, and you should be like knocking the other sides out of the park. That's what gets you top four, uh, not going out and trying to beat Liverpool, you know, black and blue. So I think it's a conservative approach. The more bigger games we play, I think this run will teach us a lot about how prepared we are to handle the rigors physically and mentally of playing against the top sides and and I think it's an opportunity you should be looking for you know I didn't I didn't dread it at all going to to Anfield and saying you know we're going to be beaten which I think is a is a good change from from the usual mindset we've had for the past couple of years yeah it didn't feel defeatist uh, I think Chelsea FCRK coming back in with a second super chat talking about uh not winning against big teams playing on players weaknesses rather than strengths uh you know kind of highlighting maybe Pacha's record versus the big six like I, I know that we uh, are not off to a this season, when we think about the fact that we've lost to uh, City and now Liverpool, I think the City result was pretty expected considering, you know, they have continuity over multiple seasons with managers and players and are also defending champions in uh, multiple seasons with uh, the best striker in the league. You know, uh, one of the best midfielders before he was injured, you know, so I think there's a lot there. This one does feel, I think, closer on the day. And, you know, maybe there's a recalibration feeling to our expectation for where this team is and the fact that you know, we will get an opportunity in, in very short order to test and see, are we actually improved against, I think, maybe the next rung down, you know, the, the Newcastle, the, the Villa, the you know, Newcastle twice, actually. Um, you know, I think Arsenal maybe still might be just a step ahead of us in terms of where they're at in, in their kind of journey on their kind of existing timeline. But yeah, I think we are going to get tests very soon here, Nick, that will let us know, like, are we actually making up any headroom there? Or are we you know still just a, a few steps behind, uh, which it might not be 
the right, the, a bad place to be considering where we were last season when we were struggling to score goals, even though we were would be doing a better job defensively at points in the season uh, and are trying to put together a campaign across four competitions. I mean, we'll be back in the conference league on Thursday. We've got then a quick turn for the premier league. Then we've got our league cup game. So like we've got, you know, three, three games from Thursday of this week to Wednesday of the following week. Like we have a, a ton of fixtures coming up, a ton of opportunity to test this team uh, and to test Maresca to see how he can manage them effectively. Yeah, I mean, we will have played all of the, the big, you know, six competitors uh, by December 8th this year. I mean, it's, you know, coming up quick, you know, you're gonna have to play them at some point. And, you know, it just feels because of the international breaks that we really haven't gotten going this year, you know, a little bit because we've been kind of off and on, off and on, but, but yeah, it gets, it gets hot really quick. And, you know, we only have, you know, Southampton and Leicester that really kind of break up those fixtures before uh, the festive period gets going. Uh, and that brings its own challenges, right. With, with the congestion that you're going to experience. So, yeah, I mean, none of this is easy. Um, what, I, what I hope the team does is take this learning that they got today and go, one, we're good enough to compete. Uh, two, really important uh, for the guys to figure out where uh, some of those errors are coming from and fix them. And three, win at home. You have to win at home. You know, losing at Anfield is not going to derail your season at all. You know, plenty of teams go to Anfield and lose. I wish we would have won today, obviously. But, like, the bigger thing is win at home, split on the road, and you're in top four. I mean, that is just the the way the fucking math works here. Like, wow. just do it. And and those next three ga- Premier League games at home are Newcastle, Arsenal, and Villa. So, you know, no, no, no sweat. No big, you know, challenge here. Easy. As we looked at... As we look to close this one, Cam, with the last kind of final comment here, I said the question, is the mustache leaving now, Nick? It was a question I should have asked at the top, but yeah. you said you were keeping it until they lost, and uh, this this does count as a loss. It, it does depend on it was, if It was I, a close shave, though. Uh, there oh, there he is. God. Oh, boy. <laughs> so just been Man, you, 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 you and Brooks with some questionable decisions on the day, Sam. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I I think I might keep it to do a Ted Lasso costume next week, but then it might be it might be time for for the for the stash to depart us. So yeah, unfortunate, but we'll see. Well, the, the stash might disappear, but there is still optimism for what Chelsea can accomplish this season. Chelsea will be back in the Conference League this Thursday. We, we will not be doing a live stream after that, but we will be doing a podcast afterwards. The Chelsea women's team are playing as we record right now in a uh, equal game at the moment after going ahead, which is a little disappointing, but hopefully they will get it across the line too. But we'll have some conversations about that as well. And I know we'll also be dropping some YouTube-specific content, and there's a Brazil or South American update that you'll be doing, Nick but that's going to do it for this one. So thank you for everybody joining us on the live stream afterwards, even though it was not a win we had a chance to talk about, but I think it was a constructive conversation about this one. So until next time, Chelsea fans, you know what to do. Keep the blue flag flying high.